Mark, thank you for inviting us to Milwaukee. It is so good to meet you today. I'm sure Norwich fans will be so excited to hear what you have to say. Welcome on board. Firstly, how does it feel to become a director at Norwich City Football Club? It's really exciting. Uh, you know, I came out to the city and, and to the last uh, match of the season and it, uh, the energy was intoxicating. And it, it sort of sunk in, in in a way that it sunk in here to, to just picture that maybe I could be part of this. Uh, I actually was, I was hopeful I could and it, it looks like I am. Yeah, that's really good to hear. And why do you feel like now is a good time? H how long had you been interested in branching out into an English football site? So it's interesting, once you're a, a professional sports owner in the United States, folks from every sport reach out to you. I think we probably had our first outreach you know, within five years for to look at uh, various soccer clubs. And this was the first one that really resonated with me. And, uh, and actually the only one of probably saw at least a, looked into at least a half a dozen. It's the only one we ever really went on a on-site diligence trip for. So what was it about Norwich then that resonated with you? So we got introduced, interestingly, uh, uh, Teddy Werner's dad, Tom, was a uh, involved in maybe the chairman of the Fenway Sports Group that you know, John Henry controls. And, and Teddy always had a passion for football with Liverpool and, and ended up, in fact, being the conduit for this, for us to take a look at this. And, uh, and it got a, a momentum very quickly. Uh, we did a, my son Mike, uh, another colleague did a video call with several other management, including uh, uh, Stuart and, and Zoe. And immediately got engaged because there were so many parallels. It was eerie, actually. The parallels between uh, the situation in Milwaukee and uh, the one in Norwich City in terms of, uh, you know, long-time passionate family ownership, uh, a community which was really attached to the team and passionate about the team. A, a wonderful city that you, from afar, you know, th those who don't know it wouldn't know, but a, a really nice place to live as as Milwaukee is and uh, just the fact that Norwich, uh, the, the football club is such an important part of the community as the baseball club in Milwaukee is. Yeah but with Milwaukee Brewers I mean you took over here was it back in 2004 for the beginning of the 2005 season uh, you made four pledges didn't you to the fans back then just just talk to us about those. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because in, uh, I knew nothing about sport. It's interesting. I thought I knew a lot about baseball as a longtime uh, fan growing up uh, in the Bronx near Yankee Stadium. And uh, I realized when I got here, I knew nothing about baseball. <laughs> and so I felt I had to ground myself. So I, I came up with four pledges. You know, sometimes you see some of these mission statements and it wasn't meant to be a mission statement. Uh, it was, you know, mission statements that have a number of things. It, it was meant to be a reminder for, for me and the management group here of what was important. So uh, first thing was to always be competitive. We called it a, being a perennially competitive team. Second was to always maintain a great fan experience. Third was to be a, a charitable leader in the community. And, and fourth uh, was to be a good place to work. And, and so every year I come back to those and, and sort of grade myself. And, and interestingly, in, in the first few years, because we, we got off to a really good start on the field, uh, we injected some money into the the payroll, and and you know the team had not made the playoffs in 22 years. Within four years, we we're in the playoffs, which is hard to do in Major League Baseball. But I really was a laggard in the charity stuff. I just and and my wife Debbie got on me and said, "Well, well, you've done a good job in these other things, but you haven't done anything with the charity." And at that point, the Community Foundation, which was actually called Brewers Charities, then was down to a few hundred thousand dollars in one scholarship fund. So we built that up to where we give out over $2 million a year to 200 area charities. I'm very proud of it. And, and by the way, one of the things that really struck me was the uh, Norwich City and, and the whole the area you, you, know, you have. I don't know what you would call it. That There's like a park and grounds and rec center and, and, and for people of all ages. Uh, we spent a, a morning there. You know, of everything I saw, and I saw a lot of things, that may have been, you know, what was the most you know, heartwarming and impressive. Have you seen the training center as well and the development that's happened there? Yeah, that. so that's uh, coming, you know, so maybe uh, I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because we, we have a big training center in spring training. And I thought, well, we'll see what their training center is. And I was really surprised in a good way. Uh, eight, you know, pitches with, you know, hopes to build more. And uh, 
you know, I, I cannot believe that you could have a, uh, you know, an infra- a building there for the, the amount of money that was spent. You know, it, it, it struck me that the facilities really were across the board world class. Uh, things can always be better. I can talk about what we did here. But um, it's a lot easier to, when you have world class infrastructure like Norwich City has, to, to work on the, the club on the field than if you have to do a number of things at once. Yeah, and our majority shareholders, Delia and Michael, have worked a lot in the last 25 years to make these things happen, hugely popular with Norwich City fans. What's your relationship been like with them? How did you get to know them? Obviously, as was the case here, so uh, Bud Selig and his family were very, uh, he was the founder of the Milwaukee Brewers. He had owned it for 35 years before our family bought in with a, a small group. And he cared a lot about who was taking it over, and, and so did they. So uh, I had to get through sort of a gauntlet of the management liking not only you know whatever you know we had, we thought economically, but that there was a personality fit, and then making sure that uh, we had a a, a similar uh, approach to things because it, it it was almost like dating, but not you know there was no contact directly with Delia and Michael was marked with intermediaries. And so we, we got sort of pre-approved to see how it would work. And, and, and so it's interesting because we were uh, a very close friend from, actually from college is also an investor and our team's gonna invest with me in this, whose name is Richard Russler. We were actually nervous to go out and meet them. <laughs> well, we, we knew if it didn't, it, you know, we, we really thought this was a good situation. But even though on, on paper they were terrific people, maybe Culturally, we wouldn't match up, and you know, Richard's a bit of a foodie, and you know, Delia's a celebrity oh, chef. Oh, perfect person. And then. so, yeah. <laughs> you know, dinner was coming out uh, at the <laughs> restaurant, and you know, at her restaurant, and you know, I'm, you know, what's what's special tonight? And I, I forgot what it was, but it was not something I would have gone for. And he's Delia said, "I recommend that." Richard said, "I'm in." <laughs> uh, you're in the right place to be trying that then, because that that sounds like a match made in heaven. But and I, and by the way, Michael, being a historian and uh, yeah. had some wonderful stories about traveling in the United States, uh, actually in the '60s, and people like uh, Robert Kennedy, who he interacted with, who were icons in in our history, he actually interacted with. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, it, it was a was a really great weekend. Long Things weekend. in common too, as well, which is really good to hear. But talk us through your actual involvement then, and and the transaction. I mean, you've bought shares, but I know you're keen to stress as well that it isn't the case of a majority stake. Just talk us through the, the transaction. Yeah, we we had looked with the club at at different structures. Michael Folger, uh, who's been a, as you know a long time supporter of the club, was was willing to sell his shares uh, to give a, a sort of a toehold in, investor. A, an opportunity to get engaged, who Delia and Michael would, you know, want in. So I think if they, if this, you know, he wasn't going to sell the shares to just any group or any person. And, and so that, and we looked at other scenarios with the club, but what really made sense at, at you know, at this point is very clear by just buying Michael's shares. And there, there may be another shareholder shares at, you know, small piece at some point that, you know, Delia and Michael are in charge. Uh, they control the board. I, I will have one board seat. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're still firmly in charge. And it gives me the opportunity to learn and and help if asked. And uh, you, usually, by the way, on boards, I don't I don't walk into the first few meetings and and, and mouth off. <laughs> it's not my style. In fact, one of the great benefits of, of buying the brewers is I had... Uh, the founder of the Brewers, Bud Selig, is the commissioner of baseball at that time. So I had this huge fountain of knowledge, you know, uh, not only about the team, but about the community. And so for the first three or four years, I'd probably call him twice a week for advice. Mm -hmm. So this is a similar situation where, you know, it's a huge benefit for for me to learn the sport, to learn it from them. Mm -hmm. And and from the management team, which, by the way, is uh, exceptional, the Zoe Stewart, Anthony, it, it really, every, everything is there. Yeah, and you talk about the fountain of knowledge, you know, that is key and wanting to learn ideas and bring fresh new ideas as well into any company, I guess. But what do you feel your arrival and the expertise you've gained and the experience in your career up to date can bring to our club from today onwards? So, you know, starting from, I really 
you know, as I found with baseball as a lifelong fan, I, I knew nothing. What, what I think, I don't even begin to think I know, can add anything from a, a football standpoint, uh, from a pure sports standpoint, but I, I know what has worked in, in our sport in terms of nutrition, uh, analytics, uh, how to uh, train. And, and so I think there might be a cross-pollination of ideas. And by the way, I think I may get some ideas from the group there that we could use in you know, training methodology here. Uh, from a finance standpoint, my, I call it my day job. I've built a money management firm uh, with a couple of other partners uh, called Crescent Capital. We manage about 42 billion US now. They, they show a little lower number. <laughs> I get competitive. I yeah. see in the, it's some a of big the price number. is 36, <laughs> 40. Yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, but so from a, you know, from a financial sophistication standpoint, I feel very comfortable in that area. And, and uh, I mentioned Richard Russell will be doing this uh, with us. He has built a group called CIM, a big real estate group. So in terms of expertise and, you know, he'll, have a point of view uh, to you know funnel in, and and by the way, the club has been working with Legends, which is a top-notch global sports and entertainment. So they're you know they're uh, when when asked in something I feel comfortable talking about, uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, but you know I I don't really think I need to chime in to Stuart Weber on, on you know whether the you know, Brazilian, young Brazilian player he got is, was the right choice or not. That, we'll leave that to him. Yeah, and that will all come. But um, with everything you say there, you sound like a very busy guy. And I mean, a flight from Milwaukee to Norwich, it's not the, the, the quickest journey, is it? So how do you plan to follow the games? Will you be mainly kind of watching them on telly or hoping to get to Norwich as and when you can? How will that all unfold? Yeah, exactly like that. So, and that's been the case here. So our, our games, we play 162 games in 180 days. And uh, five, I actually also live in Los Angeles. So five o'clock at night there, the game comes on or four o'clock if it's on the East Coast. And I, and I see a number of our games on the road and I would expect there likewise to pick matches that make sense or that are fun to come to. Or if I'm, you know, we have an office, Crescent has a, an office in London. So when I'm in London on business, absolutely. <laughs> And I shouldn't talk to the investors about this. Probably will time some of those trips to when I'd want to see the club. Uh, and I'm sure I will watch every minute. <laughs> That's really good to hear. Am I right in thinking you also um, co-own a hockey team as well in America? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a, <laughs> there's a minor league uh, team here uh, called the uh, Milwaukee Admirals that one of our investors at, at, at the Brewers owns an investment in. Uh, our family's been passionate about sports uh, Forever. You were a big Yankees fan, weren't you, I as a child? I grew up as a Yankees and it, fan. And it wasn't easy to be a Yankees fan back then, was it? No, that's actually, it's interesting. Everybody thinks, oh, front runner. But when I, uh, I grew up as a Mickey Mantle fan, but given my age, it was like 1966. And he was on the decline in the team. I think the first year I really tracked them, they were in last, last place <laughs> or second to <laughs> last place. And all the way through college, they finally started winning, and, and to my mom's chagrin, I uh, had a Latin midterm in, at Brown, and it was the year the, the, the Yankees were playing the Royals and, and clinched, and I watched the game and went out and celebrated a little bit and failed the Latin exam. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Failing a midterm in college isn't really the best way to get through school, but... Uh, it all worked out okay. It all, it, as I tell my mom... It, you know, imagine if that that wasn't following me all these years, how much how much better things would be. A little, well, well a little sarcasm. I just want to like I want to take you back to your childhood, actually, and your upbringing. What are your sort of best memories and getting into sport? So I remember the very first Yankee game I went to was opening day in 1966, sitting in the bleachers, you know, like probably then was a 50 cent seat and having Al Downing, who uh, I believe gave up the uh, either Henry Aaron's 715th home run or, or last home run. And, and it became friendly with Henry through, and Hank Aaron through owning the Brewers. And having him just look at me go like this. <laughs> like to this day, I have that mental image and, and I uh, fell in love with the sport, you know, from that point. But all, you know, as a, as a kid then, uh, things were different. You know, one of the Yankee first basemen lived in the neighborhood and would play stickball with the kids. Um, and it's it's changed now, but uh, 
my sons and I, and my wife, by the way, Debbie is a huge uh, baseball fan. She, we're all very excited about this as a sports family. Yeah. And, uh, and there's nothing like being at a match, the passion uh, and the energy. I mean, even, it, I, I would say that the passion and energy at, at an English football match rivals like playoffs here. And it's not a playoff, it's just a, a, you know, an in-season game. And they have to do with relegation and that, you know, you truly have to win every game. Every game counts there. Yeah, what are the similarities and differences between sports in America? I mean, you're kind of sport for choice with all the sports here, aren't you? But we have the relegation with football. We have promotion. What kind of similarities have you noticed and differences, I guess? Well, the, it starts with the passion the fans in the community have. You know, I often look at you know, the Selig family on this uh, team for uh, here for 35 years. Uh, we're now in the 18th season. Uh, my hope is that my sons take this over, but at some time, at some point, the Atanasios won't own the Milwaukee Brewers. Another family will, or another group will. And, and so it's really, it's really the fans team. It's not the Atanasios team. We're stewards, we're not owners. And that's clearly the case in, with English football where you know, it's, it's the, fan, the fan in the communities. And, and so that is, uh, and, and families that grow up and, and you stay a lifelong fan wherever you are. I've now met, because this has become somewhat public, folks in Los Angeles who are from Newark City. No way. And, and are excited to meet me, not because I own the Brewers, and certainly not because I run a money management firm, but because I'm gonna be getting involved with English football in Norwich City. Well, it's funny because I read that you, you were quite, or probably are quite a private person, but becoming involved in sport and everything that brings has had to change that, hasn't it? Because you are now highly recognizable, speaking to the fans in the community, which you obviously want to do, but how difficult was that for you to adjust to? That was, that was a big adjustment. Um, and it happened right away uh, when I uh, was introduced as, as the next owner. And I thought it was going to be the Celix press conference. They handed me a cap, much the same way I got handed a pin here. <laughs> a pin, a scarf, <laughs> everything we could find. <laughs> and it was like, you're on. I'm like, what? <laughs> so I, I've gotten more comfortable with that. Um, and I, I think if you just keep Look, what I try to do is go back to the four pledges and what I'm trying to do here and be true to those. You know, and, and in the first case, in, with Norwich City, try to do what, you know, help Delia and Michael do what, and, and the management team where I can help with whatever their, you know, whatever their goals are. Yeah, on that then, I saw an interview, I think it was with your brother Paul, where he was speaking about you and he said that you're a hugely successful individual, but you've still managed to stay a really nice person. How important is it that, you haven't changed who you are through your success and you live by those principles, which I'm sure you will be bringing to Norwich with you as well. Well, I think it starts, you, if, uh, Debbie and uh, Dan and Mike, uh, my immediate family keeps me grounded. In case they don't, my mom uh, is now 94 and lives next door. She keeps me grounded. Uh, she also, when things go bad, I remember I walked in her house one day and we were in a bit of a losing streak. And, hey, good morning, mom. And she says, since when are you so cheery when you're losing? Oh, wow. <laughs> She's so, there to put you down. <laughs> yeah, so that, this, it starts with, with the, the family. No, absolutely. And, and it's, uh, look, I prefer to be nice than, you know, I, and be happy, be optimistic. Yeah, no, that's really good to hear. Um, in that same documentary, actually, you were described by somebody as a bit of a risk taker at times. Would you agree with that in your career up to now? So the investment business uh, forces that because you're you're always trying to beat a benchmark or be you know in the crescent has gone to where it's gotten because we're pretty much in the first quartile or top twenty five percent in everything we do and you if you just if you don't take any risk almost by definition you will be average so the question is now when you start to make decisions are you going to be better than average or worse than average and and top or bottom. So uh, I like to think um, I'm a measured risk taker, but you do have to take you do have to take risk to to succeed because everybody whatever you're doing in, in any business, everybody else is trying to do the same thing, right? So there's 24 teams in the Championship League now that are trying to be in the was it top three or four to get popped back up. Uh, in baseball, we've got you know 30 teams trying to get to 
a handful of playoff spots. And everybody is trying really hard and has staffs of people. You know, we have, we have, I think, 200 people here in, in business management at, at the Brewers and, and baseball uh, operations. And, and you have 40 players that are on your active roster and you have another 160 under contract. So you have hundreds of people try to get moving in the same direction, same way you could see in, in, you know, at Norwich City, you have you know, fewer numbers, but all trying to do the same things. And how important is that to be wanting to move in the same direction? Everyone's on board looking for the same future. It's very, it's, I, I, I talk to the group a lot about that. I, just this week, I had conversation both with our, our field manager and our president of baseball operations and making sure that the three of us are communicating well and are on the same page and, and how we're moving forward. Back to Norwich, of course, a difficult season for us last season being relegated from the Premier League. Did that at any point make you rethink your plans with Norwich or were you already completely invested emotionally and knowing what you wanted to do? How did that kind of change your feelings, if at all? I think things changed with that first board call because uh, at that point that we're going into that call, uh, according to uh, the various metric services, the, the team had a maybe 15% chance of staying in the Premier League. And, and, and so I thought, eh, gee, they're gonna go down. But the, the Zoom call got me completely engaged. That, that was like the light switch went on. It was exactly, it was eerie, as I said, it, it, how parallel that was to this. So it could say eerie, you could say, you know, kismet, <laughs> good fortune at the way things lined up with what was happening there. And what, because by the way, as I mentioned before, when, but we brought into this team when it was at the bottom and I had everybody telling me, what are you crazy? They're losing, they're no good. And I looked at this building, I looked at the management team, including Rick Schlesinger, who's in the room here, who's our team president uh, who came out and has been working on the Norwich deal. Everything about it was good other than the, the team's performance. And by the way, the team's performance in Norwich, while well, it's disappointing, of course, to get drop, you know, there's, you know, there's two leagues below, you know, the championship league and they're right, at least in terms of the numbers this year, right at the top. And so you just need like a little tweak from somewhere for it to pop back up, including some good fortune. You know, there is some luck involved in these games and in their matches. And, and so, uh, I met the coach too, by the way, and I liked him. Yeah, I liked, I liked absolutely everybody I met there and I'm not saying that lightly. Brilliant. And as for the championship, which of course we're in right now, in the last four seasons, two of those four seasons, we've been promoted from the championship as champions. So the challenge now, of course, is to get back into the Premier League. How much do you like a challenge? Oh, it's all about the challenge. But my very first press conference here in Milwaukee, they said, well, is it that you love to win or you hate to lose? And I hate to lose. That's, that's going to be music to Norwich fans ears. We've got to hear Hate that. to lose. <laughs> Good. Whether we like them or don't like them, we're still going to try to win. Well, exactly. You mentioned a little bit earlier about um, some other American investors that you know and are in contact with. Um, American investment in English clubs isn't a new thing, but it does tend to be, or it looks like at least, it is a continuing trend. I mean, you look at Arsenal with Stan Kroenke, Chelsea now with Todd Bowley, Liverpool. Uh, why do you think that trend is continuing? So, and, and, and there's others... Uh, uh, Wes Edens at Fortress owns uh, one Aston of the clubs Villa. I know, Wes. Yep. Uh, I've talked to John Henry and Tom Warner some detail about, about all of this. And uh, look, the world has gotten uh, smaller. Uh, and so we can now, I'm, I'm going to get a, a pass, I understand, so I can watch every one of uh, you know, the Canaries matches this year. You couldn't do that 10 years ago. So you want to you wanna be in, engaged. I watched every match at the end of the season when the Premier League on, uh, was on uh, Peacock and was perfect. I was in California that time. 7 a.m., get up, cup of coffee. Okay. <laughs> Wish we had a little more offense. <laughs> <laughs> and a bit more time. <laughs> That's good. Um, but, but So I think it has to do with that. I think it has to do with, um, look, there's a financial aspect to all sports. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Sports, live sports is as engaging as the, there is in anything in, in the world. And, and these matches are, 
They're so close. And then when you learn the sport, you realize, you know, when I first, and I still have a lot to learn, but now I can actually follow, you know, time of possession and, and what, you know, the types of passes. And it's, it, I think it attracts investors for that reason. By the way, I also know uh, Jerry Cardinale at Redbird just bought into AC Milan. Oh. And, you know, we all talk about all this. Do so. you get competitive at all with those conversations? Well, I try to um, fly under the radar screen. First of all, I really don't, I'm really got a lot to learn in this. And, uh, you know, there's no point in, in when, I, when I first bought into the Brewers as in the press conference and someone from ESPN, the, you know, worldwide leader in sports, just asked them. And I said, well, you won't be so cheery when you lose 25 years in a row. Because that point we hadn't won any, been, been any playoff games and it had 12 or 13 losing seasons. So I'm not going to say anything in front of all the cameras. So when we got done, I walked over and I said, that is not the plan. And he said, well, you'll see. Well, <laughs> so there's no, you know, I, I think the, the goal, um, as the fans would want, and I think any new investor would want, well, first, I don't really look at it. It's a passion. It's not an investment. Yeah. It's a passion. You know, Delia and Michael, uh, it's a passion for them. And it's not fun to lose. Yeah. So if you're going to do it, <laughs> you want to win. Yeah, you want to win. Absolutely. And a passion for fans as well. I, I think you'll learn pretty quickly, if not already, about football in England is that speculation, rumor, gossip, all very big elements of the game. Some really like it. Some think it, it's not the best. But do you have that in America as well? Or will that take a bit of adapting to? Not, not as much. And the, the comments are more pointed on the... And I try to really stay off of social media because, first of all, I'm too old for it. And, and yeah. also... <laughs> And, 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 and it, I, you don't want to be influenced, uh, but the passion that people bring in. And, and look, I think one of the reasons that there's 40 matches, but people are talking all the time about, and player movement is much greater there. You can't sell a player for money in any sport here. Uh, but you can there and you can lend a player for money. And Yeah, the transfer window is very, very big um, in England. Uh, you say you've still got a lot to learn about soccer or football, but did you have interest in a particular football team before Norwich, as long as you don't say Ipswich, we'll completely understand if you did before now. Well, I followed Liverpool because of uh, Tom and John, you know, and, and you follow, I follow, you know, World Cup games, I cheered for Italy, went to a bunch of the Italy, actually I was in Italy one year when they were in the finals, that was pretty exciting. So I had some allegiance to my heritage. And, uh, you know, the, the World Cup is more more in, in that regard than a particular, a particular club. Okay. Um, Norwich as a club has prided itself over recent years on working really much to a self-funding model. Um, how confident can fans feel that the club's identity will remain at its core with any upcoming changes? You know, t teams in all sports need to be run responsibly. I know that's, that's hard for fans to hear. Uh, it was interesting to me that the Tottenham club has made public statements about that with all their success that as they have success and they make more money, they put it back into the team. But, you know, you, you see so many teams, it's not a axiomatic and a perfect correlation, but a as you start to have financial problems, most teams go into a downward spiral. And and the, the further you spiral down, the harder to move back up. It's one of the reasons in America, there, there's sort of a, a number of teams in baseball try to build to a World Series and then rebuild. I, I'm really not interested in rebuilding because it's not so easy to climb back up. So uh, that said, the team needs to be run responsibly. Uh, you know, I'll mention, I talked to Richard Scudamore, he used to run the, the league there, or, how, or however, you know, whatever his title was. What advice did he give you? Uh, well, one of the things he pointed out was that, uh, you know, Delia and Michael run the, the club very responsibly um, in, in every way, including that the books would be very clean they put themselves in a position to succeed every year. And you can't control what, not, we all try to control what happens on the, the field, uh, but you can't, but you can't control making sure you have great facilities, making sure you don't, you know, I've studied a couple of clubs in uh, the EPL that have made bad investments and in players and, and then that, leads to this sort of downward spiral. So you just have to be careful, but you do have to take risk. If you just every year, you know, don't take a risk, you, you know, you're probably not gonna be, 
you know, I, I think that may not be so apparent to the to the fans, but I, I think they do take risks at, at the at the Canaries at North City that allows them to move back and forth. But they're they're measured risks. You mentioned there about sort of balancing the books and the research you did before making this decision to come on board. How important were your findings there? Oh, very, well, it's very, very important. Because when, when you make a, look, as much as you, uh, you can get very emotional about being an investor or, or, or participate in, in a club. And one of the things I liked about what we're doing here is it's really more about this point board participation and, and hopefully, you know, learning about the sport and, and, and hopefully bring some knowledge of what we've done. Because I think a, the Red Sox, uh, the Fenway Sports Group, a lot of what they knew from the Red Sox was transferable to Liverpool. And I, and I know what it is. And we have all of that same uh, uh, knowledge here in, in our baseball club that they have in the Red Sox. And so in terms of everything we're talking about, analytics, training, uh, different methodologies for um, in terms of using cameras and whatnot. And in fact, some of the things I mentioned that like Norwich has that uh, wrap around, you know, you've got a virtual reality as you can see, we don't we don't have that. So, you, so. do you feel like you can learn things? Yeah, from I think there's things that we can bring versa. from there to to us here. So all that and, and all that matters. And and really, when you're looking to do something like this, you're really looking for reason not to do it, not for reasons to do it, mm -hmm. because it's you know you end up getting passionate about it. It's a lot of time, and uh, you know. And so if 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 the if the deck is sort of stacked against you which it, it really isn't for, for this club. This club has got, you know, it's got strong management. It's, Stewart has made a lot of smart moves. It's got passionate owners. It's got great facilities. It's in a great community. You know, we, we spent a couple nights going out to dinner away from with Delia and Michael at, at her restaurant and, and just walking around the town. And, and it was great. It's, re it's really nice people. You spent a morning at the community center it's it's a really it re, it reminded me a lot of, of this community. Good. It sounds it's a like place Norwich. you want to be. Yeah. Oh, that's really good to hear. Norwich made a good impression on you. Um, a very exciting time for fans. What would be your message to them right here, right now, from day one? So I'm not really in a position yet. You know, I'll be a a uh, a, a director, and so it's it's hard to send a message, other than uh, we're excited about this. Meaning, and we meaning me and, and Richard Ressler and, and my family and actually his family. His son's a big, his son Andrew's a big soccer fan, football fan. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we think we can help. Brilliant. Exciting times. Thank you very much, Mark. Great to get to know you today and um, all the best. Welcome on board. Thank you. It's great to be on board. Thank you, Alice, for coming. And, uh, Love, love my pen. Yeah, it looks good. It looks very good <laughs> on you. <laughs> Thank you.